Hi, I'm Vicki Suter, your host of the Profit Builder blog. And thanks for joining me today. I'm super excited about today's guest, Chip Doyle with Sandler Sales. Um, Chip is uh, an excellent sales trainer, consultant, coach, and we've known each other for a lot of years. And he is somebody who I very much respect and I value his contribution in this whole domain of sales and prospecting because he has such a great track record of creating success with clients and he's got a lot of depth of knowledge and expertise in this area. So I'm super excited to have him here to share with you some of his best practices around sales and prospecting. And just to give you a little bit of background, um, so Chip is with Sandler Sales and he teaches business owners, estimators, designers, and salespeople how to sell without sounding like a salesperson. Um, and since 2000, Chip has conducted several thousand private and public workshops on a variety of sale related topics throughout the US and Canada. And he's also the co-author of the book, Selling to Homeowners, the Sandler way and he writes regularly for professional remodelers magazine and he's an in-demand speaker at conferences nationally and internationally so chip welcome thank you so much for being here thank you i'm glad we're finally doing this i know we've talked about doing this forever um like i said you know chip and i've known each other for a, a long time and um, I just, I, I love his perspective and his approach to sales. And, and we've come up with some questions that I'm just going to go through and I'm going to ask you, Chip, and, and uh, we'll kind of go from, from our list of questions. We might go off, uh, off track a little bit, but I think these are some good questions that will really help people um, improve their sales and prospecting skills and learning from, from your perspective. So one of my first questions is, why should a salesperson prospect for new leads if their company generates plenty of leads for them? So that's a really good question. Um, and trust me, there's a lot of people who have been asking that, especially now, you know, the economy's good. Mm -hmm. Thank God, you know, and, and of course I work with a lot of remodeling companies and they're, they're getting tons of work right now. But the reality is, is that the, your closing ratio is primarily a function of lead source. So if you wanna be very e efficient with your time and go on appointments that result in something fruitful, you're going to need to control the lead source. Um, or obviously referrals, you know, everybody knows referrals are great and referrals are what gonna, uh, are what gonna drive your business uh, and, uh, and repeat business. They're easier to close. You're probably gonna have like a 50 to 80% closing ratio with those. On the other hand, if your company's doing traditional marketing like uh, search engine optimization or maybe traditional advertising, there's very little control uh, over the quality of the people that are contacting you. And they, mm -hmm. you know, that's always one of the ironic things I thought about for remodelers is here they're supposed to be targeting this little tiny part of their town or a little tiny uh, geographic area. And yet they're using a website which could potentially generate leads with every human being who has access to the internet on the planet. So mm -hmm. you, you definitely want to control the quality of the appointments that you're going on. And the way to do that is through prospecting. Um, the other thing too is I've had noticed a direct correlation between a salesperson's effectiveness and their effect as a salesperson um, in correlation with their effectiveness as a prospector. The good prospectors, the ones that generate leads, are usually better salespeople. And I don't know exactly why that is, but I suspect it's because they appreciate the value of a lead. If someone's gone through the work of generating a referral or they've gone to a networking event and they've pressed a lot of flesh and made a lot of friends and gotten some prospects, they appreciate how important each lead is. I do see that some salespeople um, uh, who work in companies where the, the company does generate all their leads kind of have this entitlement thing like, you know, hey, where are my leads today? Well, if you don't have any leads for me, then I guess I'll go home early. And it's like, uh, come on, that's not the right kind of attitude for a successful rainmaker. Yeah, it's, it's interesting and just in listening to you because I think that uh, I see this a lot too, where people have this um, perspective that it's somebody else's job to make the phone ring and then my job is to turn them into a sale, right? To work yes. with and whether that's the, I'm the estimator or I'm the salesperson or I'm uh, the designer or whoever that 
a lot of times people go, I will just respond to it when I've gotten a phone call. And I see people struggle with this a lot, business owners with their teams, to have them really think about um, think about it from the perspective of that your job is to be out there prospecting and to create opportunities and to create openings for people to actually make that phone call. That's right. So when you think, so from your perspective, um, and let me, let me just add something to you really quickly too. Yeah. This is you're, you're, you're touching on an issue, a, a personality issue for salespeople. Most salespeople that I work with that are really driven and want to succeed are highly independent. They love the fact that they have this independence and they can control their day and they don't have to be in the office all the time and they, they get to initiate things. And, and, and I'm one of those people. I'm fiercely independent. And so when you think about it, if you really do covet your independence, it doesn't make sense to be entirely dependent on the company to generate quality leads for you. I, if I'm independent, I don't want to be going, oh, God, I hope this person buys from me today because I don't have any more leads. That just that's not compatible with the sense of independence that most of the salespeople I train have. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you want to have more control over your destiny, if you will. Right. I want to have more that's control right. over my commissions or how much I make or what my close rate is. Then one of the best ways to do that is to be out there doing prospecting. You're saying. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. So, so um, I'm going to jump right down to this question then uh, about prospecting because it ties into this. What's the best, what are some of the best strategies for ways of prospecting? Because I, you know, part of what you touched on a minute ago was this whole thing of um, leads coming in. And I just had this conversation with somebody this morning too about that they, um, the leads that are coming in because their website is working very well. It's actually a company you and I both know well. Um, they have all these leads coming in, but they're not necessarily the best qualified leads. That's right. They right. Spend time and energy fielding out those leads that are not really their ideal leads. So, mm -hmm. you know, prospecting also serves to be able to make sure that any, what you're spending your time and energy on, right, is the, is is the useful. ideal customer useful. And those That's right. Leads. And, and, and if you're selling something that's expensive, like remodeling or construction services, those kind of things, uh, it's impossible. I know this for a fact. It is impossible to adequately qualify somebody for a, remo for a six-figure remodeling project on the telephone. Can't be done. Yeah. And I see a lot, of, a lot of business owners try to do it, and they think they're doing it. In fact, I had one out in the uh, Northeast that almost went bankrupt. Uh, because he was trying to qualify and sufficiently on the phone and wasn't going on enough appointments and was wondering what his problem was. We got him to change that instantly. But uh, yeah, the phone for qualifying is not very effective when you're, especially if you're selling big ticket items. Yeah. So the phone, it really, your, your phone conversation is simply to um, create an opportunity to get a meeting, right? Well, th there's some fundamental, there's some basic things like getting just an ounce of, pain or a little bit of a problem. Uh, the other thing that I find that's very useful on that phone call is to set the stage for what's going to happen if you come out to go see them. If you can get an agreement about what's going to happen as a result of your visit, that's very um, predictive and very powerful. Uh, but other than that, there's not a whole lot more you can get done on a telephone call. All right. All but back to your question, yeah. uh, some, of the, uh, some of the activities, especially if you're busy, would be things like uh, public speaking. Uh, nobody wants to buy from a salesperson, but everybody wants to buy from a subject matter expert. So if you can be seen as an expert in your community, you don't need to be famous globally, but if you can be seen as an expert uh, in your particular industry, in just your local community, at whether it's, you know, the, 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 the little old ladies garden club or whatever, it doesn't matter. We want, you want to be out there and have a positive reputation and be seen as an expert in your industry. And of course, the nice thing about that is you're touching many people at once. Uh, some salespeople mistakenly think it's their job to educate prospects one at a time. That is not true. Oh. They're supposed to qualify prospects one at a time. Yeah. Uh, but, but when you're sp speaking publicly, it's okay to educate a room full of people as long as there's, you know, a, a strength in numbers. Yeah. Um, another thing is to get really clear about what you're looking for. 
Um, most salespeople, and I, in fact, I even struggle. Sometimes I'll have like a, a meeting with a power partner or a potential collaborator, and I'll say, well, tell me what to look for. And they'll say things like, oh, someone who needs my service. And I'm like, I don't know how to look for that. Uh, yeah, that's tough. Uh, maybe you could give me some other clues. And they really can't verbalize what they're looking for and what they would like others to look for. So getting really clear, like for instance, you know, my elevator pitch is uh, I work with people, uh, primarily business owners who are pretty decent salespeople. Um, and um, they usually sell something that's expensive or complicated. Uh, it takes a long time to close the sale. There's a, a lot of potential for unpaid consulting. And if they are going to close the sale, there's usually a lot of discussion and negotiation about how much they're charging. Um, their primary frustration is hiring additional people uh, to be able to do sales like they do. But it really seems like it's really hard to find people who have those skill sets. So I'm describing all kinds of things that I want the listeners to pay attention to. So they'll go, oh, you know what? I know who Chip works with. I, I think I can refer him. Well, and as I listened to you just describe that, Chip, what um, what was very evident and clear in this, and for those who are watching this, maybe you noticed this too, but what Chip spoke to was what are some of the pain points that mm. someone might have or the challenges someone might have that would want to hire somebody like him to help them overcome those challenges or pains. And exactly. an important element, right, is that, and I know you talk about this uh in the way that you work with people and talk about sales is that nobody hires you unless there's something that's not working. That's there's right. Some pain that they have that they're looking for a solution for short of being a retail store. But generally if they're hiring an interior designer or somebody to do a, you know, a renovation of their home or build a new home for them or do work for them of any kind, like people don't hire you and me when, when mm. everything is perfect in sales or they're making No, never, never. Right? never. They hire us because there's a problem. And so part of what you're talking about is that ability to meet people where they are at the mm. level of their pain so that they can associate that you are a solution. So when you're talking about um, prospecting, uh, to bring this back to what your point was, you're saying um, start with being clear about what's the problem that you solve for people, essentially, right? What are what are the kind of problems that people would have? Well, not just the, yes, the problems for sure, and you heard those, but also what are some of the characteristics? of the of some of my ideal clients well what is the demographic description of my ideal client uh, i always encourage remodeling and renovation companies to say specific neighborhoods that they work in don't say the city say the actual neighborhoods get real granular paint a picture um another thing to share is uh, alternatives what other folks might do besides hiring me uh, to, to grow sales or uh, some symptoms, uh, some indicators that some pain may be soon around the corner. Those are all the things that you want to be able to clar clarify so that when you are meeting people, when you are at, an, say, a networking event, or if you are do have the opportunity to do a podcast like we're doing right now, that you can quickly uh, identify and, and people can learn what it is that you're looking for. You'll get a lot more referrals that way. But when I, and I, of course, I've been to thousands of networking events, and usually you can tell who's getting um, referrals out of it because the ones that aren't say very broad things like, you know, if you know anyone who's asking for my service, please introduce me. And the ones that are the ones that are effective in getting something out of the group are the ones that are able to describe what I just shared with you. Right. Okay. So um, we, you had suggested that for people who wanted to, um, be doing more prospecting, I said, what might be some ways to do that? You said, um, speaking so that you're educating a larger audience as opposed to educating just one-on-one mm -hmm. -on -one with people. And right. that part of the strategy for that is being clear about who your ideal customer is. I'm assuming so that again, what you're doing is narrowing down. You're not having a conversation with everybody. How do you get to your ideal audience? And and there's a certain issue around um, uh, what, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A memorability? No, that's not the word. Um, the ability for them to remember um, what your your story. The more specific your description, the more likely people are going to remember it and associate with you. If you start saying things like, "Oh, we work with anyone who can fog a mirror," you know that's kind of funny. 
um, you know, I was talking, a, a chiropractor once came up to me and I said, what are you looking for? Who's a good client for you? And he goes, anybody with a spinal column? And he thought that was really funny, but of course it was a terrible elevator pitch because it wasn't specific and it wasn't really helping me hone in on what he was looking for. Right, right. So what are some other ways, um, especially, you know, because I'll go back to what we talked about um, uh, at the very beginning and you said, which I thought was great, it's like everybody's super busy right now. And a lot of times people think I just, you know, I don't have time to go out and be doing marketing or business development or prospecting. And what happens is, you know, you're real, real busy and you're super busy. You don't have time. You don't have time. And then you haven't been prospecting. Right. So that work dries up and then it goes like this and it's this roller coaster and it's crazy. I know. So what do you recommend that people do in terms of actively prospecting right now? Um, to make sure that this isn't that doesn't happen. Yeah. Well, well, first of all, I, I I should tell you that when I started my business in 2000, it was a really tough go. Um, I remember having some very lean days back then, and I, in fact, I was making cold calls on 9/11. I mean, it really was just I have I have great respect for anyone who can start a business from scratch, but one of the things it did is it instilled in me this habit that I am never going to let my pipeline dry up ever again. And I have been mindful of that for just about 20 years now. Um, I think the advice that I would give the listeners today is to think of how you can generate referrals and other prospecting opportunities while you're talking to your customers and while you're talking to your prospects. Mm -hmm. um, there's always an opportunity to ask very specific questions like uh, from the uh, the descriptors that we just shared a few minutes ago about the characteristics and the pains and all that. Uh, every opportunity that you have with a prospect or a customer is an opportunity to prospect for referrals right then and there. Mm -hmm. And if you're not getting the referrals today, you should be planting the seeds for tomorrow. And, but the key is it's, it's mindfulness. It's realizing, okay, I'm, I'm not just here myopically focused on one thing. Mm -hmm. I am a, I'm a business owner. I'm a salesperson. I have the ability to multitask. I can have a sales conversation and close a deal, and I can also have the the mindfulness and, and intent of remembering to, to ask for some referrals or find out about a speaking engagement. I was just up in uh, Sebastopol speaking to uh, women in uh, who build, and uh, so I got there. It was a client that invited me because I told her, uh, you, "Are you in an active in any groups? They're bringing outside speakers to talk about sales." I'm, I'm always prospecting. I'm always looking for an angle of how I can speak or be published or uh, meet uh, uh, what I would call power partners, which would be someone like you who doesn't compete with me, but we're able to collaborate with clients. Mm -hmm. There's always an opportunity to prospect while you're meeting with prospects and customers. So give us three, give, give me the top, um, oh, I have two questions. So give us the top three Play, ways that you would recommend that people just in their day in day out are actively prospecting without yeah just actively prospecting and then second um, would you speak for a minute about if uh, I'm, a, I'm a remodeler I'm a interior designer um, where would you recommend that I pursue speaking engagements based on what you see with clients in uh, in those industries uh, well, so to the first part of your question relates uh, prime, uh, in, in many ways relates to the, the awareness that we need to do something. And for some of the listeners out there, this is going to be a new habit. So my first advice uh, for any of you would be to put something in your calendar to remind you that these things need to be done. I mean, if you're, if you're going to be active in social media, that's a great idea. I like social media. I tweet. Um, but if I don't put something in my calendar to remind me, oh, I need to spend five minutes writing a tweet, which is about how long it should take, I won't do it. Uh, if I don't put something, oh, I'm meeting with John Doe today, and I'm going to be having a sales appointment, and, and hopefully I'm, I'm going to get some new business from John, but here's some questions I need to ask John uh, when I go meet with him to see if I could get a referral or a speaking opportunity or a networking opportunity. The, people say, oh, I'll prospect when I have time, and they never do. Well, you know what? You need to make time for mm. prospecting. I, I joke around. I say um, uh, prospecting is sort of like uh, eating, sleeping, and going to the bathroom. 
we magically find time to do all those things every single day. And they don't take a lot of time, but we need to do them or, or we, we suffer. Well, and, so and the, part of what you're talking about is just being intentional. All right. Um, as you said, like whether it's just making the time, but it's also being intentional about now I've made the time, what do I want to have come out of that? And it doesn't have to be from a place of manipulation, but really oh, no. from a place of being prepared to create the most value in that interaction. Yeah, my that's one of the reasons, that's another reason why prospecting is so important is mm -hmm. that when I, the people that I train are selling these very expensive big ticket items, Forget about manipulation. You, you, any, if any attempt to overtly manipulate a buyer in that kind of marketplace is just going to push them away. Mm -hmm. So you really are more like a detective, and you need to find people that have problems that 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 fit your your skill set. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and of course, it all comes back to prospecting because we've got to be talking to the right people and meeting with the right people. So give me the top three prospecting places that you would tell those groups of people to be Okay, so, so first of all, when it comes to public speaking, everybody, some people are a little bit nervous. Uh, I'd encourage you to start small. If you're going to do some speaking, um, don't, don't worry about you know, speaking at uh, you know, some, some big gigantic place with 300 people. Find a place where you can, uh, you know, even if it's the Rotary Club or uh, the Kiwanis Club or, or even your church, whatever, find an opportunity uh, where you can speak professionally about your your skill sets and what you do and the kind of problems that you solve. Um, another thing is don't worry about the topic. Find the location where you can speak and ask them about the things that the part of the audience might be interested in hearing about, and then tailor your talk that way. I, it doesn't work the other way. I believe me. I've I've worked with thousands of people on this. Yeah. Um, and and then you know go out and take any speaking engagement that you can get, and it really doesn't have to be like a, a room full of your your customers, or or prospective customers. Now, after you've got about five or ten of those under your belt, uh, you're going to start feeling a little bit more confident, and you're going to get your shtick down, and you're going to have it kind of your topics built into your head, and then you can start going after uh, industry groups, uh, homeowners associations. Um, maybe there's certain developers uh, or repeat buyers that you want to get in front of. Um, and then there was one other thing that I was going to say that it just lost my thought on. Uh, it's, oh, um, speaking, every speaking engagement should lead to the next. One of the things that I like to do when I'm speaking is to ask the participants if they are active in a similar group or maybe some other kind of group that they um, are active in that where we can speak. And um, to perhaps the, that would be the next speaking engagement. There's always uh, opportunities. To talk to your customers about speaking opportunities, networking opportunities. Uh, you'll find that, uh, and the other thing, thing that's nice about a lot of these talks is they're not usually during the work hours. They're usually early in the morning or in the evening. And so there's the opportunity to get some things done that don't interfere with your normal work day. Great. All right, two other ways of prospecting. Um, referral generation, asking for referrals, making, being mindful of asking for referrals from your happy client. Um, calling past clients, that's another very low hanging fruit that very few of my clients. I mean, I remember I was talking to somebody and, and he's been in business for 30 years. And so that's great. And, and, and how's the quality of the work that you do? He goes, oh, all of our customers are very happy. I said, when was the last time you called any one of them? I was like, oh, it's really busy. I'm like, are you kidding? These, these people, every one of these people love you and they could use you again or they could refer you to somebody else. It's crazy not to stay in touch with your yeah. past client. Yeah, I actually, um, I had a similar conversation with a client a couple of months ago and I, I said, uh, here's what I encourage you to do. Like, how many do you want to call in the next month? And they set a number and they started making phone calls and I met with them a couple of weeks ago and they were like, Oh yeah. Like I got three referrals out of those. Exactly. Calls. I'm like, you just, you know, like it's top of mind thing, right? So if you're yeah. out there and you're connecting and you never know, it's like you could have done a complete home remodel for somebody and maybe they have a second home. Their neighbor needs some help. They need something done well, in the house. Maybe they're tired of that kitchen, whatever. That's that's one of the things I tell the remodeling and construction clients is when you do one project on your home, it makes the rest of your house look like crap. 
Yeah. <laughs> so there's a distinct opportunity, unless you've re, unless you've remodeled the entire home, there's a distinct possibility that there's a second or third project there. So you're crazy not to reach out to those people. Yeah. And even those, I just had this conversation with a different client last week about they did this enormous project for this woman, uh, husband and wife that finished three years ago, and they're ready to do another huge project. Yeah. So, yeah. We never know. All right. I love that. So speaking. Um, yeah. And getting into referrals from your customers, your, act, your active, your active appointments, right? And then the third is a uh, previous client. Right, right. Awesome. Those are wonderful tips, Chip. Um, I know that you have uh, something that you want to offer people, and I know that uh, we want to give people an opportunity if they want to know more information, how to get a hold of you. But before I go there, just quickly, is there anything else that you would add to this? as takeaway for people and then i would like you to just tell people how they can get a hold of you um if you have a family and uh your family is motivational to you that you you care about your income and what you do you might put a little picture of your family on your desk or in your car somewhere and and then write the word prospecting uh, or uh, over the top of it that when you realize, you know, there's a reason I'm doing this and it's not just about me feeling uncomfortable and, oh, I don't want to call a stranger and start, you know what, this is for my family. It's worth it. Nice. I like that. That's awesome. Nice way. Yeah. To Perfect. So if people want to learn more, they want to stay connected with you, what do they do? Well, so a couple of things. First of all, uh, they probably should read my, if they sell to homeowners, they should probably read my book, Selling to Homeowners the Sandler Way. Okay. Uh, that's and a I'll very a, inexpensive. There's a link down there for it. Great. Good. Okay. And um, that's a very inexpensive way to get a lot of good uh, selling tips. Um, another thing would be uh, if they'd like to get my newsletter that I write myself. It's not a canned newsletter. It's not an advertisement. It's actually sales tips for my many clients over the last 19, 20 years, they can get that if they just send me an email to chipd at sandler.com. Chipd at sandler.com. That's right. And then the last thing is I do tweet. I'm not really big on Instagram. I do a little bit of Instagram, but I do tweet. And if they'd like to get some snippets and free offers, I usually am telling people about uh, free um, conferences or teleconferences that they can attend for sales training. They can follow me on Twitter. It, my handle is Chip Sell, C-H-I-P-S-E-L-L. Great. Perfect. All right, good. And I know that you do training uh, with companies, uh, individual as well as in groups kind of stuff. And I know a lot of people who have done that work with you and have gotten huge value. So uh, for those of you listening if you're and watching, if you're interested, um, by all means, check out Chip's website. Um, send him an email so that you can get on his list and, uh, and really uh, look at what he's got to offer because he's got a lot of really great tools that can help you in doing more prospecting and consistently generating leads and selling so that you're not on that roller coaster of sales, but you can really nail that. Um, and develop that expertise in your business and with your team because he works with a lot of teams too. So Chip, thank you. Thank you so much for being on the blog today. I really appreciate it. I appreciate you sharing your expertise. And for all of you watching and listening, I wish you all of the best in helping you grow, thrive, and prosper in your business and in your life. And I hope that you found today's topic to be helpful to that end.